The Hour of the Dragon by Robert E. Howard Part 1 Chapter 1 O Sleeper Awake The long tapers flickered, sending the black shadows wavering along the walls, and the velvet tapestries rippled. Yet there was no wind in the chamber. Four men stood about the ebony table on which lay the green sarcophagus that gleamed like carven jade. In the upraised right hand of each man a curious black candle burned with a weird greenish light. Outside was night and a lost wind moaning among the black trees. Inside the chamber was tense silence and the wavering of the shadows, while four pairs of eyes, burning with intensity, were fixed on the long green case across which cryptic hieroglyphics righted, as if lent life and movement by the unsteady light. The man at the foot of the sarcophagus leaned over it and moved his candle as if he were writing with a pen, inscribing a mystic symbol in the air. Then he set down the candle in its black gold stick at the foot of the case, and, mumbling some formula unintelligible to his companions, he thrust a broad white hand into his fur-trimmed robe. When he brought it forth again, it was as if he cupped in his palm a bowl of living fire. The other three drew in their breath sharply, and the dark, powerful man who stood at the head of the sarcophagus whispered, The heart of Ahriman. The other lifted a quick hand for silence. Somewhere a dog began howling dolefully, and a stealthy step padded outside the barred and bolted door. But none looked aside from the mummy case over which the man in the ermine-trimmed robe was now moving the great flaming jewel, while he muttered an incantation that was old when Atlantis sunk. The glare of the gem dazzled their eyes so that they could not be sure of what they saw. But with a splintering crash, the carven lid of the sarcophagus burst outward as if from some irresistible pressure applied from within, and the four men, bending eagerly forward, saw the occupant. A huddled, withered, wizened shape with dried brown limbs like dead wood showing through moldering bandages. Bring that thing back, muttered a small dark man who stood on the right with a short sardonic laugh. It is ready to crumble at a touch. We are fools. Shh! It was an urgent hiss of command from the large man who held the jewel. Perspiration stood upon his broad white forehead and his eyes were dilated. He leaned forward and, without touching the thing with his hand, laid on the breast of the mummy the blazing jewel. Then he drew back and watched with fierce intensity, his lips moving in soundless invocation. It was as if a globe of living fire flickered and burned on the dead, withered bosom, and breath sucked in, hissing through the clenched teeth of the watchers. For as they watched, an awful transmutation became apparent. The withered shape in the sarcophagus was expanding, was growing, lengthening. The bandages burst and fell into brown dust. The shivelled limbs swelled, straightened, their dusky hue began to fade. By Mitra, whispered a tall yellow-haired man on the left, he was not a Stygian, that part at least was true. Again a trembling finger warned for silence. The hound outside was no longer howling. He whimpered, as with an evil dream, and then that sound too died away in silence, in which the yellow-haired man plainly heard the straining of the heavy door, as if something outside pushed powerfully upon it. He half turned, his hand at his sword, but the man in the ermine robe hissed an urgent warning. Stay, do not break the chain! 
and on your life do not go to that door. The yellow haired man shrugged and turned back and then he stopped short, staring. In the jade sarcophagus lay a living man, a tall lusty man, naked, white of skin and dark of hair and beard. He lay motionless, his eyes wide open and blank and unknowing as a newborn's babes. On his breast the great jewel smoldered and sparkled. The man in ermine reeled as if from some letdown of extreme tension. Ishtar, he gasped, it is Altotun, and he lives. Valerius, Taraskus, Amalric, do you see? Do you see? You adopted me, but I have not failed. We have been close to the open gates of hell this night, and the shapes of darkness have gathered close about us. I. They followed him to the very door, but we have brought the great magician back to life. And damned our souls to purgatory's everlasting, I doubt not, muttered the small dark man, Taraskus. The yellow-haired man, Valerius, laughed harshly. What purgatory can be worse than life itself? So we are all damned together from birth. Besides, who would not sell his miserable soul for a throne? There is no intelligence in his stare, Orestes, said the large man. He has long been dead, answered Orestes. He is as one newly awakened. His mind is empty after the long sleep. Nay, he was dead, not sleeping. We brought his spirit back over the voids and gulfs of night and oblivion. I will speak to him. He bent over the foot of the sarcophagus, and fixing his gaze on the wide dark eyes of the man within, he said slowly, Awake, Zaltotun! The lips of the man moved mechanically. The lips of the man moved mechanically. Zaltotun! He repeated in a groping whisper. You are Zaltotun! exclaimed Orestes, like a hypnotist driving home his suggestions. You are Zaltotun of Python in Acheron. A dim flame flickered in the dark eyes. I was Zaltotun, he whispered. I am dead. You are Zaltotun, cried Orestes. You are not dead, you live. I am Zaltotun, came the eerie whisper. But I am dead. In my house in Kemi, in Stygia, there I died. And the priests who poisoned you mummified your body with their dark arts, keeping all your organs intact, exclaimed Orestes. But now you live again. The heart of Ahriman has restored your life, drawn your spirit back from space and eternity. The heart of Ahriman... The flame of remembrance grew stronger. The barbarians stole it from me. He remembers, muttered Orestes. Lift him from the case. The others obeyed hesitantly, as if reluctant to touch the man they had recreated, and they seemed not easier in their minds when they felt firm muscular flesh, vibrant with blood and life beneath their fingers. But they lifted him upon the table, and Orestes clothed him in a curious dark velvet robe, splashed with gold stars and crescent moons, and fastened a cloth of gold fillet about his temples, confining the black wavy locks that fell to his shoulders. He let them do as they would, saying nothing, not even when they set him in a carven throne-like chair with a high ebony back and wide silver arms and feet like golden claws. He sat there motionless, and slowly intelligence grew in his dark eyes and made them deep and strange and luminous. It was as if long sunken witch lights floated slowly up through midnight pools of darkness. Orestes cast a furtive glance at his companions, who stood staring in morbid fascination at their strange guest. 
Their iron nerves had withstood an ordeal that might have driven weaker men mad. He knew it was with no weaklings that he conspired, but men whose courage was as profound as their lawless ambitions and capacity for evil. He turned his attention to the figure in the ebon black chair, and this one spoke at last. I remember, he said in a strong, resonant voice, speaking in a median with a curious, archaic accent. I am Zalto Thun, who was high priest of Seth in Python, which was in Acheron, the heart of Achriman. I dreamed I have found it again. Where is it? Orestes placed it in his hand, and he drew breath deeply as he gazed into the depths of the terrible jewel burning in his grasp. They stole it from me long ago, he said. The red heart of the night it is, strong to save or to damn. It came from afar and from long ago. While I held it, none could stand before me, but it was stolen from me and Daheron fell, and I fled an exile into dark Stygia. Much I remember, but much I have forgotten. I have been in a far land, across misty voids and gulfs and unlit oceans. What is the year? Orestes answered him. It is the waning of the year of the lion, three thousand years after the fall of Acheron. Three thousand years, murmured the other. So long, who are you? I am Orestes, once a priest of Mitra. This man is Amalric, baron of Tor in the Media. This other is Terescus, younger brother of the king of Nemedia, and this tall man is Valerius, rightful heir of the throne of Aquilonia. Why have you given me life? demanded Xaltotun. What do you require of me? The man was now fully alive and awake, his keen eyes reflecting the working of an unclouded brain. There was no hesitation or uncertainty in his manner. He came directly to the point as one who knows that no man gives something for nothing. Orestes met him with equal candor. We have opened the doors of hell this night to free your soul and return it to your body because we need your aid. We wish to place Terescus on the throne of Nemedia and to win for Valerius the crown of Aquilonia. With your necromancy you can aid us. Zaltotunes' mind was devious and full of unexpected slants. You must be deep in the arts yourself, Orestes, to have been able to restore my life. How is it that a priest of Mitra knows of the heart of Ahriman and the incantations of Skelos? I am no longer a priest of Mitra, answered Orestes. I was cast forth from my order because of my delving in black magic, but for Amalric there I might have been burned as a magician. But that left me free to pursue my studies. I journeyed in Zamora, in Ventia, in Stygia, and among the haunted jungles of Kitai. I read the iron-bound books of Skelos, and talked with unseen creatures in deep wells, and faceless shapes in black reeking jungles. I obtained a glimpse of your sarcophagus in the demon-haunted crypts below the black, giant walled temple of Set in the hinterlands of Stygia, and I learned of the arts that would bring back life to your shriveled corpse. From moldering manuscripts I learned of the heart of Ahriman. Then for a year I sought its hiding place, and at last I found it. Then why trouble to bring me back to life? demanded Zaltotun with his piercing gaze fixed on the priests. Why did you not employ the heart to further your own power? Because no man today knows the secrets of the heart, answered Orestes. Not even in legends live the arts by which to lose its full powers. I knew it could restore life of its deeper secrets. I am ignorant. I merely use it to bring you back to life. 
it is the use of your knowledge we seek. As for the heart, you alone know its awful secrets. Lal Tatoon shook his head, staring broodingly into the flaming depths. My necromantic knowledge is greater than the sum of all the knowledge of other men, he said. Yet I do not know the full power of the jewel. I did not invoke it in the old days. I guarded it lest it be used against me. At last it was stolen, and in the hands of a feathered shaman of the barbarians, he defeated all my mighty sorcery. Then I vanished, and I was poisoned by the jealous priests of Stygia before I could learn where it was hidden. It was hidden in a cavern below the temple of Mitra in Tarantia, said Orestes. By devious ways I discovered this after I had located your remains in Set's subterranean temple in Stygia. Zamorian thieves partly protected by spells I learned from sources better left unmentioned, stole your mummy case from under the very talons of those which guarded it in the dark, and by camel caravan and galley and ox wagon it came at last to this city. Those same thieves, or rather those of them who still lived after their frightful quest, stole the heart of Ahriman from its haunted cavern below the temple of Mitra and all the skills of men and the spells of sorcerers nearly failed. One man of them lived long enough to reach me and give the jewel into my hands, before he died slavering and gibbering of what he had seen in that accursed crypt. The thieves of Zamora are the most faithful of men to their trust. Even with my conjurements, none but them could have stolen the heart from where it has lain in a demon-guarded darkness since the fall of Acheron three thousand years ago. Zaltotun lifted his lion-like head and stared far off into space as if plumbing the lost centuries. Three thousand years, he muttered. Set, tell me what has changed in the world. The barbarians who overthrew Acheron set up new kingdoms, quoted Orestes. Where the empire had stretched now rose realms called Aquilonia and Emedia and Argos from the tribes that founded them. The older kingdoms of Ophir, Corinthian and Western Koth, which had been subject to the kings of Acheron, regained their independence with the fall of the empire. And what of the people of Acheron? demanded Zaltotun. When I fled into Stygia, Python was in ruins, and all the great purple tower cities of Acheron fouled with blood and trampled by the sandals of the barbarians. In the hills, small groups of folk still boast descent from Acheron, answered Orestes. For the rest, the tide of my barbarian ancestors rolled over them and wiped them out. They my ancestors had suffered much from the kings of Acheron. A grim and terrible smile curled the Pythonians' lips. Aye, many a barbarian, both men and women, died screaming on the altar under this hand. I have seen their heads piled to make a pyramid in the great square in Python when the kings returned from the west with their spoils and naked captives. Aye, and when the day of reckoning came, the sword was not spared, so Aheron ceased to be, and purple-towered Python became a memory of forgotten days. But the younger kingdoms rose on the imperial ruins and vexed great, and now we have brought you back to aid us to rule these kingdoms, which, if less strange and wonderful than Aheron of old, are yet rich and powerful, well worth fighting for. Look! Orestes unrolled before the stranger a map drawn cunningly on vellum. Zaltotun regarded it and then shook his head baffled. The very outlines of the land are changed. It is like some familiar thing seen in a dream, fantastically distorted. How bite? answered Orestes, tracing with his forefinger. 
Here is Belverus, the capital of Nemedia in which we now are. Here run the boundaries of the land of Nemedia. To the south and southeast are Ophir and Corinthia, to the east Brithunia, to the west Aquilonia. It is the map of a world I do not know, said Zaltotun softly, but Orestes did not miss the lurid fire of hate that flickered in his dark eyes. It is a map you shall help us change, answered Orestes. It is our desire first to set Tarascus on the throne of Nemedia. We wish to accomplish this without strife and in such a way that no suspicion will rest on Tarascus. We do not wish the land to be torn by civil wars, but to reserve all our power for the conquest of Aquilonia. Should King Nimed and his sons die naturally, in a plague for instance, Tarascus would mount a throne as the next heir, peacefully and unopposed. Zaltotun nodded without replying and Orestes continued. The other task will be more difficult. We cannot set Valerius on the Aquilonian throne without a war, and that kingdom is a formidable foe. Its people are a hardy, warlike race, toughened by continual wars with the Picts, Zingarians and Cimmerians. For 500 years Aquilonia and Nemedia have intermittently waged war, and the ultimate advantage has always lain with the Aquilonians. Their present king is the most renowned warrior among the western nations. He is an outlander, an adventurer who seized the crown by force during a time of civil strife, strangling King Nemedides with his own hands upon the very throne. His name is Conan and no man can stand before him in battle. Valerius is now the rightful heir of the throne. He had been driven into exile by his royal kinsman Nemedides and has been away from his native realm for years, but he is of the blood of the old dynasty and many of the barons would secretly hail the overthrow of Conan, who is a nobody without royal or even noble blood. But the common people are loyal to him and the nobility of the outlying provinces. Yet. If his forces were overthrown in the battle that must first take place and Conan himself slain, I think it would not be difficult to put Valerius on the throne. Indeed, with Conan slain, the only center of the government would be gone. He is not part of a dynasty, but only a lone adventurer. I wish that I might see this king mused Zaltotun, glancing toward a silvery mirror which formed one of the panels of the wall. This mirror cast no reflection, but Zaltotun's expression showed that he understood its purpose. And Orastes nodded with the pride of good craftsman takes in the recognition of his accomplishments by a master of his craft. I will try to show him to you, he said and seating himself before the mirror, he gazed hypnotically into its depths where presently a dim shadow began to take shape. It was uncanny, but those watching knew it was no more than the reflected image of Orestes' thought, embodied in that mirror as a wizard's thoughts are embodied in a magic crystal. It floated hazily, then leaped into startling clarity. A tall man, mightily shouldered and deep of chest, with a massive corded neck and heavily muscled limbs. He was clad in silk and velvet, with the royal lions of Aquilonia worked in gold upon his rich jupon, and the crown of Aquilonia shone on his square-cut black mane. But the great sword at his side seemed more natural to him than the regal accoutrements. His brow was low and broad, his eyes a volcanic blue that smoldered as if with some inner fire. His dark, scarred, almost sinister face was that of a fighting man, and his velvet garments could not conceal the hard, dangerous lines of his limbs. That man is no Hyborian! exclaimed Zaltotun, 
No, he is a Cimmerian, one of those wild tribesmen who dwell in the grey hills of the north. I fought his ancestors of old, muttered Zaltotun. Not even the kings of Acheron could conquer them. They still remain a terror to the nations of the south, answered Orestes. He is a true son of that savage race and has proved himself thus far unconquerable. Zaltatun did not reply. He sat staring down at the pool of living fire that shimmered in his hand. Outside, the hound howled again, long and shudderingly. Chapter 2 The Black Wind Blows The year of the dragon had birth in war and pestilence and unrest. The black plague stalked through the streets of Belverus, striking down the merchant in his stall, the serf in his kennel, the knight at his banquet board. Before it the arts of the leeches were helpless. Men said it had been sent from hell as punishment for the sins of pride and lust. It was swift and deadly as the stroke of an edda. The victor's body turned purple and then black, and within a few minutes he sank down dying, and the stench of his own putrefaction was in his nostrils even before death wrenched his soul from his rotting body. A hot, roaring wind blew incessantly from the south, and the crops withered in the fields, the cattle sank and died in their tracks. Men cried out on Mitra and muttered against the king, for somehow throughout the kingdom the word was whispered that the king was secretly addicted to loathsome practices and foul debauches in the seclusion of his knighted palace. And then in that palace death walked grinning on feet about which swirled the monstrous vapors of the plague. In one night the king died with his three sons, and the drums that thundered their dirge drowned the grim and ominous bells that rang from the cars that lumbered through the streets, gathering up the rotting dead. That night, just before dawn, the hot wind that had blown for weeks ceased to rustle evilly through the silken window curtains. Out of the north rose a great wind that roared among the towers, and there was cataclysmic thunder and blinding sheets of lightning and driving rain. But the dawn shone clean and green and clear, the scorched ground veiled itself in grass, the thirsty crops sprang up anew, and the plague was gone. Its miasma swept clean out of the land by the mighty wind. Men said the gods were satisfied because the evil king and his spawn were slain, and when his younger brother Tereskus was crowned in the great coronation hall, the populace cheered until the towers rocked, acclaiming the monarch on whom the gods smiled. Such a wave of enthusiasm and rejoicing as swept the land is frequently the signal for a war of conquest. So no one was surprised when it was announced that King Tarascus had declared a truce made by the late king with their western neighbors void and was gathering his hosts to invade Aquilonia. His reason was candid, his motives loudly proclaimed, gilded his actions with something of the glamour of a crusade. He espoused the cause of Valerius, rightful heir to the throne, he came, he proclaimed, not as an enemy of Aquilonia, but as a friend to free the people from the tyranny of a usurper and a foreigner. If there were cynical smiles in certain quarters and whispers concerning the king's good friend Amalric, whose vast personal wealth seemed to be flowing into the rather depleted royal treasury, they were unheeded in the general wave of fervor and zeal of Tarascus's popularity. If any shrewd individuals suspected that Amalric was the real ruler of Nemedia, behind the scenes they were careful not to voice such heresy. 
and the war went forward with enthusiasm. The king and his allies moved westward at the head of 50,000 men, knights in shining armor with their pennons streaming above their helmets, pikemen in steel caps and brigandines, crossbowmen in leather jerkins. They crossed the border, took a frontier castle and burned three mountain villages, and then, in the valley of the Valkia, ten miles west of the boundary line, they met the hosts of Conan, king of Aquilonia, 45,000 knights, archers and men-at-arms, the flower of Aquilonian strength and chivalry. Only the knights of Poitain under Prospero had not yet arrived, for they had far to ride up from the southwestern corner of the kingdom. Tarascus had struck without warning. His invasion had come on the heels of his proclamation without formal declaration of war. The two hosts confronted each other across a wide, shallow valley with rugged cliffs and a shallow stream winding through masses of reeds and willows down the middle of the vale. The camp followers of both hosts came down to this stream for water and shouted insults and hurled stones across to at one another. The last glints of the sun shone on the golden banner of Nemedia with the scarlet dragon, unfurled in the breeze above the pavilion of King Tarascus on an eminence near the eastern cliffs. But the shadow of the western cliffs fell like a vast purple pole across the tents and the army of Aquilonia, and upon the black banner with its golden lion that floated above King Conan's pavilion. All night the fires flared the length of the valley, and the wind brought the call of trumpets, the clangor of arms, and the sharp challenges of the sentries who paced their horses along either edge of the willow-grown stream. It was in the darkness before dawn that King Conan stirred on his couch, which was no more than a pile of silks and furs thrown on a dais and awakened. He started up, crying out sharply and clutching at his sword. Palantides, his commander, rushing in at the cry, saw his king sitting upright, his hand on his hilt, and perspiration dripping from his strangely pale face. Your majesty, exclaimed Palantides, is aught amiss? What of the camp? demanded Conan. Are the guards out? Five hundred horsemen patrol the stream, your majesty, answered the general. The Nemedians have not offered to move against us in the night. They wait for dawn, even as we. By Krum, muttered Conan, I awoke with a feeling that doom was creeping on me in the night. He stared up at a great golden lamp which shed a soft glow over the velvet hangings and carpets of the great tent. They were alone, not even a slave or a page slept on the carpeted floor. But Conan's eyes blazed as they were wont to blaze in the teeth of a great peril, and a sword quivered in his hand. Palantides watched him uneasily. Conan seemed to be listening. Listen, hissed the king. Did you hear it? A your dive step. Seven knights guard your tent, your majesty, said Palantides. None could approach it unchallenged. Not outside, growled Conan. It seemed to sound inside the tent. Palantides cast a swift, startled look around. The velvet hangings merged with shadows in the corners, but if there had been anyone in the pavilion besides themselves, the general would have seen him. Again he shook his head. There is no one here, sire. You sleep in the midst of your host. I have seen death strike a king in the midst of thousands, muttered Conan. Something that walks on invisible feet and is not seen. Perhaps you were dreaming, your majesty, said Palantides, someone perturbed. So I was, 
grunted Conan. A devilish dream it was. I trod again all the long, weary roads. I traveled on my way to the kingship. He fell silent, and Palantida stared at him, unspeaking. The king was an enigma to the general, as the most of his civilized subject. Palantides knew that Conan had walked many strange roads in his wild, eventful life, and had been many things before a twist of fate set him on the throne of Aquilonia. I saw again in the battlefield whereon I was born, said Conan, resting his chin moodily on a massive fist. I saw myself in a panther skin loin cloud throwing my spear at the mountain beasts. I was a mercenary swordsman again, a hetman of the Kozaki who dwell along the Zaporoska river, a corsair looting the coasts of Kush, a pirate of the Barachan Isles, a chief of the Himalayan hillmen. All these things have been, and of all these things I dreamed, all the shapes that I have been, I passed like an endless procession, and their feet beat out a dirge in the sounding dust. But throughout my dreams moved strange, wailed figures and ghostly shadows, and a faraway voice mocked me. And toward the last, I seemed to see myself lying on this dais in my tent, and a shape bent over me, robed and hooded. I lay unable to move, and then the hood fell away, and a moldering skull grinned down at me. Then it was that I awoke. This is an evil dream, your majesty said Palantides, suppressing a shudder, but no more. Conan shook his head, more in doubt than in denial. He came of a barbaric race, and of superstitions and instincts of his heritage lurked close beneath the surface of his consciousness. I have dreamed many evil dreams, he said, and most of them were meaningless, but by Krom, this was not like most dreams. I wish this battle were fought and won, for I have had a grisly premonition ever since King Nymed died in the Black Plague. Why did it cease when he died? Men say he sinned. Men are fools, as always, grunted Conan. If the plague struck all who sinned, then by Crom there wouldn't be enough left to count the living. Why should the gods, who the priests tell me are just, slay five hundred peasants and merchants and nobles before they slew the king, if the whole pestilence were aimed at him? Were the gods smiting blindly, like swordsmen in a fog? By Mitra, if I aimed my strokes no straighter, Aquilonia would have had a new king long ago. No! The black plagues, no common pestilence. It lurks in Stygian tombs and is called forth into being only by wizards. I was a swordsman in Prince Almeric's army that invaded Stygia, and of his thirty thousand, fifteen thousand perished by Stygian arrows, and the rest by the black plague that rolled on us like a wind out of the south. I was the only man who lived. Yet only five hundred died in the media, argued Palantides. Whoever called it into being knew how to cut it short at will, answered Conan. So I know there was something planned and diabolical about it. Someone called it forth. Someone banished it when the work was completed. When Taraskus was safe on the throne and being hailed as the deliverer of the people from the wrath of the gods. By Krom, I sense a black, subtle brain behind all this. What of this stranger who men say gives counsel to Taraskus? He wears a whale, 
answered Palantides. They say he is a foreigner, a stranger from Stygia. A stranger from Stygia, repeated Conan, scowling. A stranger from hell, more like. Ha! Huh, what is that? The trumpets of the Nemedians, exclaimed Palantides. And hark, how our own blare upon their heels. Dawn is breaking, and the captains are marshalling the hosts for the onset. Mitra be with them, for many will not see the sun go down behind the crags. Send my squires to me, exclaimed Conan, rising with alacrity and casting off his velvet night garment. He seemed to have forgotten his forebodings at the prospect of action. Go to the captains and see that all is in readiness. I will be with you as soon as I don my armor. Many of Conan's ways were inexplicable to the civilized people he ruled, and one of them was his insistence on sleeping alone in his chamber or tent. Palantides hastened from the pavilion, clanking in the armor he had donned at midnight after a few hours sleep. He cast a swift glance over the camp, which was beginning to swarm with activity. Mail clinking and men moving about dimly in the uncertain light among the long lines of tents. Stars still glimmered palely in the western sky, but long pink streamers stretched along the eastern horizon, and against them the dragon banner of Nemedia flung out its billowing silken folds. Palantides turned toward a smaller tent nearby, where slept the royal squires. These were tumbling out already, roused by the trumpets. And as Palantides called to them to hasten, he was frozen speechless by a deep fierce shout and the impact of a heavy blow inside the king's tent, followed by a hard stopping crash of a falling body. There sounded a low laugh that turned the generals' blood to ice. Echoing the cry, Palantides wheeled and rushed back into the pavilion. He cried out again as he saw Cornance's powerful frame stretched out on the carpet. The king's great two-handed sword lay near his hand, and a shattered tent pole seemed to show where his sword had fallen. Palantides' sword was out, and he glared about the tent, but nothing met his gaze. Save for the king and himself, it was empty, as it had been when he left it. Your Majesty! Palantides threw himself on his knee beside the fallen giant. Conan's eyes were open, they blazed up at him with full intelligence and recognition. His lips writhed, but no sound came forth. He seemed unable to move. Voices sounded without. Palantides rose swiftly and stepped to the door. The royal squires and one of the knights who guarded the tent stood there. We heard a sound within, said the knight apologetically. Is all well with the king? Palantides regarded him searchingly. None has entered or left the pavilion this night. None save yourself, my lord answered the knight, and Palantides could not doubt his honesty. The king stumbled and dropped his sword, said Palantides briefly. Return to your post. As the knight turned away, the general covertly motioned to the five royal squires, and when they had followed him in, he drew the flap closely. They turned pale at the sight of the king stretched upon the carpet, but Palantides's quick gesture checked their exclamations. The general bent over him again, and again Conan made an effort to speak. The veins in his temples and the cords in his neck swelled with his efforts, and he lifted his head clear of the ground. Voice came at last, mumbling and half intelligible. The thing, the thing in the corner. Palantides lifted his head and looked fearfully about him. He saw the pale faces of the squires in the lamplight, the velvet shadows that lurked along the walls of the pavilion. That was all. 
There is nothing there, your majesty, he said. It was there in the corner, muttered the king, tossing his lion-maned head from side to side in his effort to rise. A man, at least he looked like a man, wrapped in rags like a mummy's bandages with a moldering cloak drawn about him and a hood. All I could see was his eyes as he crouched there in the shadows. I thought he was a shadow himself until I saw his eyes. They were like black jewels. I made at him and swung my sword, but I missed him clean. How? Crom knows and splintered that ball instead. He caught my wrist and I staggered off balance and his fingers burned like hot iron. All the strength went out of me and the floor rose and struck me like a club. Then he was gone and I was down and curse him. I can't move. I'm paralyzed. Palantides lifted the giant's hand and his flesh crawled. On the king's wrist showed the blue marks of long, lean fingers. What hand could grip so hard as to leave its print on that thick wrist? Palantides remembered that low laugh he had heard as he rushed into the tent and cold perspiration beaded his skin. It had not been Conan who laughed. This is a thing diabolical whispered a trembling squire. Men say the children of darkness war for Tarascus. Be silent, ordered Palantides sternly. Outside, the dawn was dimming the stars. A light wing sprang up from the peaks and brought the fanfare of a thousand trumpets. At the sound, a convulsive shudder ran through the king's mighty form. Again, the veins in his temples knotted as he strove to break the invisible shackles which crushed him down. Put my harness on me and tie me into my saddle, he whispered. I'll lead the charge yet. Palantides shook his head and a squire plucked his skirt. My lord, we are lost if the host learns the king has been smitten. Only he could have led us to victory this day. Help me lift him on the dais, answered the general. They obeyed and laid the helpless giant on the furs and spread a silken cloak over him. Palantides turned to the five squires and searched their pale faces long before he spoke. Our lips must be sealed forever as to what happens in this tent, he said at last. The kingdom of Aquilonia depends upon it. One of you go and fetch me the officer Valenus, who is a captain of the Pelian spearmen. The squire indicated bowed and hastened from the tent, and Palantides stood staring down at the stricken king while outside trumpets blared, drums thundered, and the roar of the multitudes rose in the growing dawn. Presently the squire returned with the officer Palantides had named, a tall man, broad and powerful, built much like the king. Like him also he had thick black hair, but his eyes were grey and he did not resemble Conan in his features. The king is stricken by a strange melody, said Palantides briefly. A great honor is yours. You are to wear his armor and ride at the head of the host today. None must know that it is not the king who rides. It is an honor for which a man might gladly give up his life, stammered the captain, overcome by the suggestion. Mitra grant that I do not fail of this mighty trust. And while the fallen king stared with burning eyes that reflected the bitter rage and humiliation that ate his heart, the squire stripped Valenus of mail shirt, burgonet and leg pieces, and clad him in Conan's armor of black plate mail, with the wizard salade and the dark plumes nodding over the wyvern crest. Over all they put the silken surcoat with the royal lion worked in gold upon the breast, 
and they guard him with a broad gold buckled belt which supported the jewel hilted broadsword in a cloth of gold scabbard. While they worked, trumpets clamored outside, arms clanged, and across the river rose a deep throated roar as squadron after squadron swung into place. Full armed, Velenus dropped to his knee and bent his plumes before the figure that lay on the dais. Lord King Mitra grant that I do not dishonor the harness I wear this day. Bring me Tarascus' head and I'll make you a baron. In the stress of his anguish, Conan's veneer of civilization had fallen from him. His eyes flamed, he ground his teeth in fury and bloodlust, as barbaric as any tribesmen in the Cimmerian hills. Chapter 3 The Cliffs Reel The Aquilonian host was drawn up, long serried lines of pikemen and horsemen in gleaming steel, when a giant figure in black armor emerged from the royal pavilion and, as he swung up into the saddle of the black stallion held by four squires, a roar that shook the mountains went up from the host. They shook their blades and thundered forth their acclaim of their warrior king. Knights in gold-chased armor, pikemen in mail coats and bassinets, archers in their leather jerkins with their long bows in their hands. The host on the opposite side of the valley was in motion, trotting down the long, gentle slope toward the river. Their steel shone through the mists of morning that swirled about their horses' feet. The Aquilonian host moved leisurely to meet them. The measured tramp of the armored horses made the ground tremble. Banners flung out long silken folds in the morning wind. Lances swayed like a bristling forest, dipped and sank, their pennons fluttering about them. Ten men at arms, grim taciturn veterans who could hold their tongues, guarded the royal pavilion. One squire stood in the tent, peering out through a slit in the doorway. But for the handful in the secret, no one else in the vast host knew that it was not Conan who rode on the great stallion at the head of the army. The Aquilonian host had assumed the customary formation. The strongest part was their center, composed entirely of heavily armed knights. The wings were made of smaller bodies of horsemen, mounted men-at-arms mostly, supported by pikemen and archers. The latter were Bosonians from the western marches, strongly built men of medium stature, in leathern jackets and iron headpieces. The Namedian army came on in similar formation, and the two hosts moved toward the river, the wings in advance of the centers. In the center of the Aquilonian host, the great lion banner streamed its billowing black folds over the steel-clad figure on the black stallion. But on his days, in the royal pavilion, Conan groaned in anguish of spirit and cursed with strange heathen oaths. The hosts move together, quoth the squire watching from the door. Hear the trumpets peal. Ha! The rising sun strikes fire from lance heads and helmets until I'm dazzled. It turns the river crimson. Aye, it will be truly crimson before this day is done. The four have reached the river. Now arrows fly between the hosts like the stinking clouds that hide the sun. Ha! Well loosed, bowmen. The Bosonians have the better of it. Hark to them shout! Faintly in the ears of the king, above the din of trumpets and clanging steel, came the deep, fierce shout of the Bosonians as they drew and loosed in perfect unison. Their archers seek to hold ours in play while their knights ride into the river, said the squire. The banks are not steep, they slope to the water's edge. The knights come on, they crash through the willows. By Mitra, the cloth yard shafts find every crevice in their harness. 
Horses and men go down, struggling and threshing in the water. It is not deep, nor is the current swift, but men are drowning there, dragged under by their armor and trampled by the frantic horses. Now the knights of Aquilonia advance. They ride into the water and engage the knights of Nemedia. The water swirls about their horses' bellies and the clang of swords against sword is deafening. Crumb! Burst in agony from Conan's lip. Life was coursing sluggishly back into his veins, but still he could not lift his mighty frame from the dais. The wings close in, said the squire. Pikemen and swordsmen fight hand to hand in the stream, and behind them the bowmen ply their shafts. By Mitra, the Nemedian arbalesters are sorely harried, and the Bosonians arch their arrows to drop amid the rear ranks. Their center gains not a foot, and their wings are pushed back up from the stream again. Crom, Emir and Mitra, raged Conan. Gods and devils, could I but reach their fighting, if but to die at the first blow. Outside, through the long hot day, the battle stormed and thundered. The valley shook to charge and countercharge to the whistling of shafts and the crash of rending shields and splintering lances. But the hosts of Aquilonia held fast. Once they were forced back from the bank, but a counter charge with a black banner flowing over the black stallion regained the lost ground. And like an iron rampart, they held the right bank of the stream, and at last the squire gave Conan the news that the Nemedians were falling back from the river. Their wings are in confusion, he cried. The knights reel back from the sword play. But what is this? Your banner is in motion. The center sweeps into the stream. By Mitra, Valenus is leading the host across the river. Fool! groaned Conan. It may be a trick. He should hold his position. By dawn, Prospero will be here with the Poitanian levies. The knights ride into a hail of arrows, cried the squire. But they do not falter. They sweep on. They, they have crossed. They charge up the slope. Palantides has hurled the wings across the river to their support. It is all he can do. The lion banner dips and staggers above the melee. The knights of Nemedia make a stand. They are broken. They fall back. Their left wing is in full flight, and our pikemen cut them down as they run. I see Valenus riding and smiting like a madman. He is carried beyond himself by the fighting lust. Men no longer look to Palantides. They follow Valenus deeming him Conan as he rides with closed visor. But look, there is method in his madness. He swings wide of the Nemedian front with five thousand knights to pick off the army. The main host of the Nemedians is in confusion. And look, their flank is protected by the cliffs. But there is a defile left unguarded. It is like a great cleft in the wall that opens again behind the Nemedian lines. By Mitra, Valenus sees and seizes the opportunity. He has driven their wings before him, and he leads his knights towards that defile. They swing wide of the main battle. They cut through a line of spearmen. They charge into the defile. An ambush! cried Conan, striving to struggle upright. No! shouted the squire exultantly. The whole Nemedian host is in full flight. They have forgotten the defile. They never expected to be pushed back that far. Oh, fool, fool Tarascus, to make such a blunder. Ah, I see lances and pennons pouring from the further mouth of the defile, beyond the Nemedian lines. They will smite those ranks from the rear and crumple them. Mitra, what is this? He staggered as the walls of the tent swayed drunkenly. Afar over the thunder of the fight rose a deep bellowing roar, indescribably ominous. The cliffs reel, 
shrieked the squire. Oh gods, what is this? The river forms off its channel and the peaks are crumbling. The ground shakes and horses and riders in armor are overthrown. The cliffs, the cliffs are falling. With his words there came a grinding rumble and a thunderous concussion and the ground trembled. Over the roar of the battle sounded screams of mad terror. The cliffs have crumbled, cried the livid squire. They have thundered down into the defile and crushed every living creature in it. I saw the lion banner wave an instant amidst the dust and falling stones, and then it vanished. Ha! Huh! The Nemedians shout with triumph. Well may they shout for the fall of the cliffs has wiped out five thousand of our bravest knights. Hark! To Conan's ears came a vast torrent of sound, rising and rising in frenzy. The king is dead, the king is dead. Flee, flee, the king is dead. Liars! panted Conan. Dogs, knaves, cowards! Oh, Crom, if I could but stand, but crawl to the river with my sword in my teeth, how, oh, boy, do they flee? I sobbed the squire. They spur the river, they are broken, hurled on like spume before a storm. I see Palantida striving to stem the torrent. He is down, and the horses trample him. They, they rush into the river, knights, bowmen, pikemen, all mixed and mingled in one mad torrent of destruction. The Nemedians are on their heels, cutting them down like corn. But they will make a stand on this side of the river, cried the king. With an effort that brought the sweat dripping from his temples, he heaved himself up on his elbows. Nay! cried the squire. They cannot. They are broken, routed. Oh, gods, that I should live to see this day. Then he remembered his duty and shouted to the men-at-arms who stood stolidly watching the flight of their comrades. Get a horse swiftly and help me lift the king upon it. We dare not bide here. But before they could do his bidding, the first drift of the storm was upon them. Knights and spearmen and archers fled among the tents, stumbling over ropes and baggage, and mingled with them were the median riders who smote right and left at all alien figures. Tent ropes were cut, fire sprang up in a hundred places, and the plundering had already begun. The grim guardsmen about Conan's tent died where they stood, smiting and thrusting, and over their mangled corpses beat the hooves of the conquerors. But the squire had drawn the flap close, and in the confused madness of the slaughter none realized that the pavilion held an occupant. So the flight and the pursuit swept past and roared away up the valley, and the squire looked out presently to see a cluster of men approaching the royal tent with evident purpose. Here comes the king of Nemedia with four companions and his squire, quoth he. He will accept your surrender, my fair lord. Surrender the devil's heart, gritted the king. He had forced himself up to a sitting posture. He swung his legs painfully off the dais and staggered upright, reeling drunkenly. The squire ran to assist him, but Conan pushed him away. Give me that bow, he gritted, indicating a long bow and quiver that hung from the tent pole. But your majesty, cried the squire in great perturbation, the battle is lost, it were the part of majesty to yield with the dignity becoming one of royal blood. I have no royal blood, ground Conan, I am a barbarian and the son of a blacksmith. Wrenching away the bow and an arrow, he staggered toward the opening of the pavilion. So formidable was his appearance, naked but for short leather breeks and sleeveless shirt, open to reveal his great hairy chest, 
with his huge limbs and his blue eyes blazing under his tangled black mane that the squire shrank back, more afraid of his king than of the whole Nemedian host. Reeling on wide braced legs, Conan drunkenly tore the door flap open and staggered out under the canopy. The king of Nemedia and his companions had dismounted and they halted short, staring in wonder at the apparition confronting them. Here I am, you jackals, roared the Cimmerian. I am the king, death to you, dog brothers. He jerked the arrow to its head and loosed, and the shaft feathered itself in the breast of the knight who stood beside Tarascus. Conan hurled the bow at the king of Nemedia. Curse my shaky hand! Come in and take me if you dare! Reeling backward on unsteady legs, he fell with his shoulders against a tent pole and propped upright, he lifted his great sword with both hands. By Mitra, it is the king! swore Tarascus. He cast a swift look about him and laughed. That other was a jackal in his harness. In dogs and take his head! The three soldiers, men at arms wearing the emblem of the royal guards, rushed at the king, and one fell the squire with a blow of a mace. The other two fared less well. As the first rushed in, lifting his sword, Conan met him with a sweeping stroke that severed male links like cloth and sheared an Amedians' arm and shoulder clean from his body. His corpse, pitching backward, fell across his companions' legs. The man stumbled and before he could recover, the great sword was through him. Conan wrenched out his steel with a wrecking gasp and staggered back against the tent pole. His great limbs trembled, his chest heaved, and sweat poured down his face and neck. But his eyes flamed with exultant savagery as he panted, Why do you stand afar off, dog of Belverus? I can't reach you. Come in and die. Tarascus hesitated, glanced at the remaining men-at-arms and his squire, a gaunt saturnine man in black mail, and took a step forward. He was far inferior in size and strength to the giant Cimmerian, but he was in full armor and was famed in all the western nations as a swordsman, but his squire caught his arm. Nay, your majesty, do not throw away your life. I will summon archers to shoot this barbarian as we shoot lions. Neither of them had noticed that a chariot had approached while the fight was going on and now came to a halt before them. But Conan saw, looking over his shoulder, and a queer, chill sensation crawled along his spine. There was something vaguely unnatural about the appearance of the black horses that drew the vehicle, but it was the occupant of the chariot that arrested the king's attention. He was a tall man, superbly built, clad in a long unadorned silk robe. He wore a shamitish headdress, and its lower folds hid his features, except for the dark magnetic eyes. The hands that grasped the reins, pulling the rearing horses back on their haunches, were white but strong. Conan glared at the stranger, all his primitive instincts roused. He sensed an aura of menace and power that executed from this veiled figure, a menace as definite as the windless waving of tall grass that marks the path of the serpent. Hail Zaltotun! exclaimed Tarascus, here is the king of Aquilonia, he did not die in the landslide as we thought. I know, answered the other, without bothering to say how he knew. What is your present intention? I will summon the archers to slay him, answered the Nemedian, as long as he lives he will be dangerous to us. Yet even a dog has uses 
answers Altatun. Take him alive. Conan laughed raspingly. Come in and try, he challenged. But for my treacherous legs, I'd hew you out of that chariot like a woodman hewing a tree. But you'll never take me alive, damn you! He speaks the truth, I fear, said Tereskus. The man is a barbarian with the senseless ferocity of a wounded tiger. Let me summon the archers. Watch me and learn wisdom, advised Zaltatun. His hand dipped into his robe and came out with something shining, a glistening sphere. This he threw suddenly at Conan. The Cimmerian contemptuously struck it aside with his sword. At the instant of contact there was a sharp explosion, a flare of white blinding flame, and Conan pitched senseless to the ground. He is dead? Tarascus' tone was more assertion than inquiry. No, he is but senseless. He will recover his senses in a few hours. Bid your men bind his arms and legs and lift him into my chariot. With a gesture, Tarascus did so, and they heaved the senseless king into the chariot, grunting with their burden. Zaltotun threw a velvet cloak over his body, completely covering him from any who might peer in. He gathered the reins in his hands. I'm for Belverus, he said. Tell Amalric that I will be with him if he needs me. But with Conan out of the way and his army broken, lance and sword should suffice for the rest of the conquest. Prospero cannot be bringing more than 10,000 to the field, and will doubtless fall back to Tarantia when he hears the news of the battle. Say nothing to Amalric or Valerius or anyone about our capture. Let them think Conan died in the fall of the cliffs. He looked at the men at arms for a long space until the guardsmen moved restlessly, nervous under the scrutiny. What is that about your waist? Zaltatun demanded. Why, my, my girdle, may it please you, my lord, stuttered the amazed guardsman. You lie! Zaltatun's laugh was merciless as a sword edge. It is a poisonous serpent. What a fool you are to wear a reptile about your waist. With distended eyes the man looked down, and to his utter horror he saw the buckle of his girdle rear up at him. It was a snake's head. He saw the evil eyes and the dripping fangs, heard a hiss and felt the loathsome contact of the thing about his body. He screamed hideously and struck at it with his naked hand, felt its fangs flesh themselves in that hand, and then he stiffened and fell heavily. Taraskus looked down at him without expression. He saw only the leathern girdle and the buckle, the pointed tongue of which was stuck in the guardsman's palm. Zaltotun turned his hypnotic gaze on Tarascus' squire, and the men turned ashen and began to tremble, but the king interposed. Nay, we can trust him. The sorcerer taunted the reins and swung the horses around. See that this piece of work remains secret. If I am needed, let Altaro Orestes' servant summon me as I have taught him. I will be in your palace at Belvarus. Tarascus lifted his hand in salutation, but his expression was not pleasant to see as he looked after the departing mesmerist. Why should he spare the Cimmerian? whispered the frightened squire. That I am wondering myself, grunted Tarascus. Behind the rumbling chariot the dull roar of battle and pursuit faded in the distance. The setting sun rimmed the cliffs with scarlet flame, and the chariot moved into the vast blue shadows floating up out of the east. Chapter 4 From what hell have you crawled? Of that long ride in the chariot of Zaltotun, Conan knew nothing. 
He lay like a dead man while the bronze wheels clashed over the stones of mountain roads and swished through the deep grass of fertile valleys. And finally, dropping down from the rugged heights, rumbled rhythmically along the broad white road that winds through the rich meadowlands to the walls of Belverus. Just before dawn, some faint reviving of life touched him. He heard a mumble of voices, the groan of ponderous hinges. Through a slit in the cloak that covered him, he saw, faintly in the lurid glare of torches, the great black arch of a gateway, and the bearded faces of men-at-arms, the torches striking fire from their spearheads and helmets. How went the battle, my fair lord? spoke an eager voice in the Nemedian tongue. Well indeed, was the curt reply. The king of Aquilonia lies slain and his host is broken. A bubble of excited voices rose, drowned the next instant by the whirling wheels of the chariot on the flags. Sparks flashed from under the revolving rims as Zaltotun lashed his steeds through the arch. But Conan heard one of the guardsmen mutter, From beyond the border to Belverus, between sunset and dawn, and the horses scarcely sweating, by Mitra, they... Then silence drank the voices, and there was only the clatter of hoofs and wheels along the shadowy street. What he had heard registered itself on Conan's brain, but suggested nothing to him. He was like a mindless automaton that hears and sees, but does not understand. Sights and sounds flowed meaninglessly about him. He lapsed again into a deep lethargy, and was only dimly aware when the chariot halted in a deep high walled court, and he was lifted from it by many hands and borne up a winding stone stair and down a long dim corridor. Whispers, stealthy footsteps, unrelated sounds surged or rustled about him, irrelevant and far away. Yet his ultimate awakening was abrupt and crystal clear. He possessed full knowledge of the battle in the mountains and its sequences, and he had a good idea of where he was. He lay on a velvet couch, clad as he was the day before, but with his limbs loaded with chains not even he could break. The room in which he lay was furnished with somber magnificence, the walls covered with black velvet tapestries, the floor with heavy purple carpets. There was no sign of door or window, and one curiously carven gold lamp swinging from the fretted ceiling shed a lurid light over all. In that light, the figure seated in a silver, throne-like chair before him seemed unreal and fantastic, with an elusiveness of outline that was heightened by a filmy silken robe. But the features were distinct, unnaturally so in that uncertain light. It was almost as if a weird nimbus played about the man's head, casting the bearded face into bold relief so that it was the only definite and distinct reality in that mystic ghostly chamber. It was a magnificent face with strongly chiseled features of classical beauty. There was indeed something disquieting about the calm tranquility of its aspect, a suggestion of more than human knowledge of a profound certitude beyond human assurance. Also, an uneasy sensation of familiarity twitched at the back of Conan's consciousness. He had never seen this man's face before, he well knew, yet those features reminded him of something or someone. It was like encountering in the flesh some dream image that had haunted one in nightmares. Who are you? demanded the king belligerently, struggling to a sitting position in spite of his chains. Men call me Zaltotun, was the reply in a strong golden voice. What place is this? the Cimmerian next demanded. 
a chamber in the palace of King Terascus in Belverus. Conan was not surprised. Belverus, the capital, was at the same time the largest Nemedian city so near the border. And where's Taraskus? With the army? Well, growled Conan, if you mean to murder me, why don't you do it and get it over with? I did not save you from the king's archers to murder you in Belverus, answered Zaltatun. What the devil did you do to me? demanded Conan. I blasted your consciousness, answers Altotun. How? You would not understand. Call it black magic if you will. Conan had already reached that conclusion and was mulling over something else. I think I understand why you spared my life, he rumbled. Amalric wants to keep me as a check on Valerius. In case the impossible happens and he becomes king of Aquilonia. It's well known that the Baron of Thor is behind this move to seat Valerius on my throne. And if I know Amalric, he doesn't intend that Valerius shall be anything more than a figurehead, as Tarascus is now. Amalric knows nothing of your capture, answers Altotun. Neither does Valerius. Both think you died at Valkia. Conan's eyes narrowed as he stared at the man in silence. I sensed the brain behind all this, he muttered, but I thought it was Amalric's. Or Amalric, Taraskus and Valerius, all but puppets dancing on your string. Who are you? What does it matter? If I told you, you would not believe me. What if I told you I might set you back on the throne of Aquilonia? Conan's eyes burn on him like a wolf. What's your price? Obedience to me? Go to hell with your offer, snarled Conan. I'm no figurehead. I've won my crown with my sword. Besides, it's beyond your power to buy and sell the throne of Aquilonia at your will. The kingdom's not conquered. One battle doesn't decide a war. You war against more than swords, answered Zaltotun. Was it a mortal sword that felled you in your tent before the fight? Nay, it was a child of the dark, a waif of outer space whose fingers were afire with the frozen coldness of the black gulfs which froze the blood in your veins and the marrow of your thews. Coldness, so cold, it burned your flesh like white hot iron. Was it chance that led the man who wore your harness to lead his knights into the defile? Chance that brought the cliffs crashing down upon them? Conan glared at him unspeaking, feeling a chill along his spine. Wizards and sorcerers abounded in this barbaric mythology, and any fool could tell that this was no common man. Conan sensed an inexplicable something about him that set him apart. An alien aura of time and space, a sense of tremendous and sinister antiquity but his stubborn spirit refused to flinch. The fall of the cliffs was a chance, he muttered truculently. The charge into the defile was what any man would have done. Not so. You would not have led a charge into it. You would have suspected a trap. You would never have crossed the river in the first place, until you were sure the Nemedian route was real. Hypnotic suggestions would not have invaded your mind, even in the madness of battle, to make you mad and rush blindly into the trap laid for you, as it did the lesser man who masqueraded as you. Then, if this was all planned, Conan grunted skeptically, all a plot to trap my host, why did not the child of darkness kill me in my tent? Because I wish to take you alive. 
It took no wizardry to predict that Palantides would send another man out in your harness. I wanted you alive and unhurt. You may fit into my scheme of things. There is a vital power about you greater than the craft and cunning of my allies. You are a bad enemy, but might make a fine vessel. Conan spat savagely at the word, and Zaltotun, ignoring his fury, took a crystal globe from a nearby table and placed it before him. He did not support it in any way, nor place it on anything, but it hung motionless in mid-air, as solidly as if it rested on an iron pedestal. Conan snorted at this bit of necromancy, but he was nevertheless impressed. Would you know of what goes on in Aquilonia? He asked. Conan did not reply, but the sudden rigidity of his form betrayed his interest. Zaltotun stared into the cloudy depths and spoke. It is now the evening of the day after the Battle of Valkyria. Last night the main body of the army camped by Valkyria, while squadrons of knights harried the fleeing Aquilonians. At dawn the host broke camp and pushed westward through the mountains. Prospero, with 10,000 Poitanians, was miles from the battlefield when he met the fleeing survivors in the early dawn. He had pushed on all night, hoping to reach the field before the battle joined. Unable to rally the remnants of the broken host, he fell back toward Tarantia. Riding hard, replacing his wearied horses with steeds seized from the countryside, he approaches Tarantia. I see his weary knights, their armor gray with dust, their pennons drooping as they push their tired horses through the plain. I see also the streets of Tarantia. The city is in turmoil. Somehow word had reached the people of the defeat and the death of King Conan. The mob is mad with fear, crying out that the king is dead and there is none to lead them against the Nemedians. Giant shadows rush on Aquilonia from the east and the sky is black with vultures. Conan cursed deeply. What are those but words? The raggedest beggar in the street might prophesy as much. If you say you saw all that in the glass bowl, then you're a liar as well as a knave, of which last there's no doubt. Prospero will hold Tarantia and the barons will rally to him. Count Trocero of Poitain commands the kingdom in my absence and he'll drive these Nemedian dogs howling back to their kennels. What are 50,000 Nemedians? Aquilonia will swallow them up. They'll never see Belverus again. It's not Aquilonia which was conquered at Valkia. It was only Conan. Aquilonia is doomed, answers Altatun unmoved. Lance and axe and torch shall conquer her. Or if they fail, Powers from the dark of ages shall march against her. As the cliffs fell at Valkia, so shall walled cities and mountains fall, if the need arise, and rivers roar from their channels to drown whole provinces. Better if steel and bowstring prevail without further aid from the arts, for the constant use of mighty spells sometimes sets forces in motion that might rock the universe. From what hell have you crawled, united dog? muttered Conan, staring at the man. The Cimmerian involuntarily shivered. He sensed something incredibly ancient, incredibly evil. Saltatoon lifted his head as if listening to whispers across the void. He seemed to have forgotten his prisoner. Then he shook his head impatiently and glanced impersonally at Conan. What? Why, if I told you, you would not believe me. But I am wearied of conversation with you. 
It is less fatiguing to destroy a walled city than it is to frame my thoughts in words a brainless barbarian can understand. If my hands were free, opined Conan, I'd soon make a brainless corpse out of you. I do not doubt it, if I were fool enough to give you the opportunity, answered Zaltotun, clapping his hands. His manner had changed, there was impatience in his tone and a certain nervousness in his manner, though Conan did not think this attitude was in any way connected with himself. Consider what I have told you, barbarian, said Zaltotun. You will have plenty of leisure, I have not yet decided what I shall do with you. It depends on circumstances yet unborn, but let this be impressed upon you, that if I decide to use you in my game, it will be better to submit without resistance than to suffer my wrath. Conan spat a curse at him, just as hangings that masked a door swung apart and four giant negroes entered. Each was clad only in a silken breech clout, supported by a girdle, from which hung a great key. Zaltotun gestured impatiently toward the king and turned away, as if dismissing the matter entirely from his mind. His fingers twitched queerly. From a cavern green jade box he took a handful of shimmering black dust and placed it in a brazier which stood on a golden tripod at his elbow. The crystal globe, which he seemed to have forgotten, fell suddenly to the floor, as if its invisible support had been removed. Then the black said lifted Conan, for so loaded with chains was he that he could not walk and carried him from the chamber. A glance back before the heavy gold bound teak door was closed showed him Zaltotun leaning back in his throne like chair. His arms folded while a thin wisp of smoke curled up from the brazier. Conan's scalp prickled. In Stygia, that ancient and evil kingdom that lay far to the south, he had seen such black dust before. It was the pollen of the black lotus, which creates death-like sleep and monstrous dreams. And he knew that only a grisly wizard of the black ring, which is the nadir of evil, voluntarily seek the scarlet nightmares of the black lotus to revive their necromantic powers. The Black Ring was a fable and a lie to most folk of the western world, but Conan knew of its ghastly reality and its grim votaries who practiced their abominable sorceries amid the black vaults of Stygia and the nighted domes of accursed Sabbatia. He glanced back at the cryptic, gold-bound door shuddering at what it hid. Whether it was day or night, the king could not tell. The palace of King Taraskus seemed a shadowy, nighted place that shunned natural illumination. The spirit of darkness and shadow hovered over it, and that spirit, Conan felt, was embodied in the stranger's alto tune. The negroes carried the king along a winding corridor so dimly lighted that they moved through it like black ghosts bearing a dead man, and down a stone stair that wound endlessly. A torch in the hand of one cast a great deformed shadows streaming along the wall. It was like the descent into hell of a corpse borne by dusky demons. At last they reached the foot of the stair, and then they traversed a long straight corridor with a blank wall on one hand, pierced by an occasional arched doorway with a stair leading up behind it, and on the other hand another wall showing heavy barred doors at regular intervals of a few feet. Halting before one of these doors, one of the blacks produced the key that hung at his girdle and turned it in the lock. 
Then, pushing open the grill, they entered with their captive. They were in a small dungeon with heavy stone walls, floor and ceiling, and in the opposite wall there was another grill door. What lay beyond that door, Conan could not tell, but he did not believe it was another corridor. The glimmering light of the torch flickering through the bars hinted at shadowy spaciousness and echoing depths. In one corner of the dungeon, near the door through which they had entered, a cluster of rusty chains hung from a great iron ring set in the stone. In these chains a skeleton dangled. Conan glared at it with some curiosity, noticing the state of the bare bones, most of which were splintered and broken. The skull, which had fallen from the vertebrae, was crushed as if by some savage blow of tremendous force. Stolidly, one of the blacks, not the one who had opened the door, removed the chains from the ring using his key on the massive lock and dragged the mass of rusty metal and shattered bones over to one side. Then they fastened Conan's chains to that ring, and the third black turned his key in the lock of the farther door, grunting when he had assured himself that it was properly fastened. Then they regarded Conan cryptically, slit-eyed ebony giants, the torch striking highlights from their glossy skin. He who held the key to the nearer door was moved to remark gutturally, this is your palace now, white dog king. None but master and we know. All palace sleep. We keep secret. You live and die here, maybe. Like him. He contemptuously kicked the shattered skull and sent it clattering across the stone floor. Conan did not deign to reply to the taunt, and the black, galled perhaps by his prisoner's silence, muttered a curse, stooped and spat full in the king's face. It was an unfortunate move for the black. Conan was seated on the floor, the chains about his waist, ankles and wrists locked to the ring in the wall. He could neither rise nor move more than a yard out from the wall, but there was considerable slack in the chains that shackled his wrists and before the bullet-shaped head could be withdrawn out of reach, the king gathered this slack in his mighty hand and smote a black on the head. The man fell like a butchered ox, and his comrades stared to see him lying with his skull played open and blood oozing from his nose and ears. But they attempted no reprisal, nor did they accept Conan's urgent invitation to approach within reach of the bloody chain in his hand. Presently, grunting in their ape-like speech, they lifted the senseless black and bore him out like a sack of wheat, arms and legs dangling. They used his key to lock the door behind them, but did not remove it from the gold chain that fastened it to his girdle. They took the torch with them, and as they moved up the corridor, the darkness slunk behind them like an animate thing. Their soft padding footsteps died away with the glimmer of their torch, and darkness and silence remained unchallenged. Chapter 5 The Haunter of the Pits Conan lay still, enduring the weight of his chains and the despair of his position, with the stoicism of the wilds that had bred him. He did not move, because the jangle of his chains, when he shifted his body, sounded startlingly loud in the darkness and stillness, and it was his instinct, born of a thousand wilderness-bred ancestors, not to betray his position in his helplessness. This did not result from a logical reasoning process. He did not lie quiet because he reasoned that the darkness hid lurking dangers that might discover him in his helplessness. 
Zaltotun had assured him that he was not to be harmed, and Conan believed that it was in the man's interest to preserve him, at least for the time being. But the instincts of the wild were there, that had caused him in his childhood to lie hidden and silent while wild beasts prowled about his covert. Even his keen eyes could not pierce the solid darkness. Yet, after a while, after a period of time he had no way of estimating, a faint glow became apparent, a sort of slanting grey beam by which Conan could see vaguely the bars of the door at his elbow and even make out the skeleton of the other grill. This puzzled him until at last he realized the explanation. He was far below ground in the pits below the palace, yet for some reason a shaft had been constructed from somewhere above. Outside, the moon had risen to a point where its light slanted dimly down the shaft. He reflected that in this manner he could tell the passing of the days and nights. Perhaps the sun too would shine down that shaft, though on the other hand it might be close by day. Perhaps it was a subtle method of torture, allowing a prisoner but a glimpse of daylight or moonlight. His gaze fell on the broken bones in the farther corner, glimmering dimly. He did not task his brain with futile speculations as to who the wretch had been and for what reason he had been doomed, but he wondered at the shattered condition of the bones. They had not been broken on a wreck. Then, as he looked, another unsavory detail made itself evident. The shin bones were split lengthwise, and there was but one explanation. They had been broken in that manner in order to obtain the marrow. Yet, what creature but man breaks bones for their marrow? Perhaps those remnants were mute evidence of a horrible cannibalistic feast of some wretch driven to madness by starvation. Conan wondered if his own bones would be found at the same future date, hanging in their rusty chains. He fought down the unreasoning panic of a trapped wolf. The Cimmerian did not curse, scream, weep or rave as a civilized man might have done, but the pain and turmoil in his bosom were nonetheless fierce. His great limbs quivered with the intensity of his emotions. Somewhere far to the westward, the Nemedian host was slashing and burning its way through the heart of his kingdom. The small host of Poitanians could not stand before them. Prospero might be able to hold Tarantia for weeks or months, but eventually, if not relieved, he must surrender to greater numbers. Surely the barons would rally to him against the invaders. But in the meanwhile he, Conan, must lie helpless in a darkened cell, while others led his spears and fought for his kingdom. The king ground his powerful teeth in red rage. Then he stiffened as outside the farther door he heard a stealthy step. Straining his eyes, he made out a bent, indistinct figure outside the grill. There was a rasp of metal against metal, and he heard a clink of tumblers, as if a key had been turned in the lock. Then the figure moved silently out of his range of vision. Some guard, he supposed, trying to lock. After a while, he heard a sound repeated faintly somewhere farther on and that was followed by the soft opening of a door, and then a swift scurry of softly shod feet retreated in the distance. Then silence fell again. Conan listened to what seemed a long time, but which could not have been, for the moon still shone down the hidden shaft, but he heard no further sound. He shifted his position at last, and his chains clanked. Then he heard another lighter footfall, a soft step outside a nearer door, 
the door through which he had entered the cell. An instant later, a slender figure was etched dimly in the grey light. King Conan, a soft voice intoned urgently. Oh my lord, are you there? Where else? He answered guardedly, twisting his head about to stare at the apparition. It was a girl who stood grasping the bars with her slender fingers. The dim glow behind her outlined her supple figure through the wisp of silk twisted about her loins and shone vaguely on jeweled breastplates. Her dark eyes gleamed in the shadows, her white limbs glistened softly like alabaster. Her hair was a mess of dark foam at a burnished luster of which the dim light only hinted. The keys to your shackles and to the farther door, she whispered, and a slim white hand came through the bars and dropped three objects with a cling to the flags beside him. What game is this? he demanded. You speak in the Nemedian tongue, and I have no friends in the media. What deviltry is your master up to now? Has he sent you here to mock me? It is no mockery. The girl was trembling violently. Her bracelets and breastplates clinked against the bars she grasped. I swear by Mitra. I stole the keys from the black jailers. They are the keepers of the pits and each bears a key which will open only one set of locks. I made them drunk. The one whose head you broke was carried away to a leech and I could not get his key. But the others I stole. Oh, please do not loiter. Beyond these dungeons lie the pits which are the doors to hell. Somewhat impressed, Conan tried the keys dubiously, expecting to meet only failure and a burst of mocking laughter. But he was galvanized to discover that one, indeed, loosed him of his shackles, fitting not only the lock that held them to the ring, but the locks on the limbs as well. A few seconds later, he stood upright, exulting fiercely in his comparative freedom. A quick stride carried him to the grill, and his fingers closed about a bar and a slender wrist that was pressed against it, imprisoning the owner, who lifted her face bravely to his fierce gaze. Who are you, girl? he demanded. Why do you do this? I am only Zenobia, she murmured, with a catch of breathlessness as if in fright. Only a girl of the King Seraglio. Unless this is some cursed trick, muttered Conan, I cannot see why you bring me these keys. She bowed her dark head and then lifted it and looked full into his suspicious eyes. Tears sparkled like jewels on her long dark lashes. I am only a girl of the King Seraglio she said with a certain humility. He has never glanced at me and probably never will. I am less than one of the dogs that gnaw the bones in his banquet hall. But I am no painted toy, I am a flesh and blood. I breathe, hate, fear, rejoice and love. And I have loved you, King Conan, ever since I saw you riding at the head of your knights along the streets of Belverus when you visited King Nymed years ago. My heart tugged at its strings to leap from my bosom and fall in the dust of the street under your horse's hoofs. Color flooded her countenance as she spoke, but her dark eyes did not waver. Conan did not at once reply. Wild and passionate and untamed he was, yet any but the most brutish of men must be touched with a certain awe or wonder at the bearing of a woman's naked soul. She bent her head then and pressed her red lips to the fingers that imprisoned her slim wrist. Then she flung up her head as if in sudden recollection of her position and terror flared in her dark eyes. Haste, 
She whispered urgently, It is past midnight. You must be gone. But won't they skin you alive for stealing these keys? They'll never know. If the black men remember in the morning who gave them the wine, they will not dare admit the keys were stolen from them while they were drunk. The key that I could not obtain is the one that unlocks this door. You must make your way to freedom through the pits. What awful perils lurk beyond that door, I cannot even guess. But greater danger lurks for you if you remain in this cell. King Tereskus has returned. What? Tereskus? Aye, he has returned in great secrecy, and not long ago he descended into the pits and then came out again, pale and shaking, like a man who had dared a great hazard. I heard him whisper to his squire, Aridius, that despite Zaltotun you should die. What of Zaltotun? murmured Conan. He felt her shudder. Do not speak of him, she whispered. Demons are often summoned by the sound of their names. The slaves say he lies in his chamber behind a bolted door, dreaming the dreams of the Black Lotus. I believe that even Tarascus secretly fears him, or he would slay you openly. But he has been in the pits tonight, and what he did here only Mitra knows. I wonder if that could have been Tarascus who fumbled at my cell door a while ago, muttered Conan. Here is a dagger, she whispered, pressing something through the bars. His eager fingers closed on an object familiar to their touch. Go quickly through yonder door, turn to the left and make your way along the cells until you come to a stone stair. On your life do not stray from the line of the cells. Climb the stair and open the door at the top. One of the keys will fit it. If it be the will of Mitra, I will await you there. Then she was gone with a patter of light slippered feet. Conan shrugged his shoulders and turned toward the farther grill. This might be some diabolical trap planned by Tereskus, but plunging headlong into a snare was less abhorrent to Conan's temperament than sitting meekly to await his doom. He inspected the weapon the girl had given him and smiled grimly. Whatever else she might be, she was proven by that dagger to be a person of practical intelligence. It was no slender stiletto, selected because of a jeweled hilt or gold guard, fitted only for dainty murder in my lady's boudoir. It was a forthright poniard, a warrior's weapon, broad-bladed, fifteen inches in length, tapering to a diamond-sharp point. He grunted with satisfaction. The feel of the hilt cheered him and gave him a glow of confidence. Whatever webs of conspiracy were drawn about him, whatever trickery and treachery ensnared him, this knife was real. The great muscles of his right arm swelled in anticipation of murderous blows. He tried the farther door, fumbling with the keys as he did so. It was not locked, yet he remembered the black man locking it. That furtive, bent figure then had been no jailer seeing that the bolts were in place. He had unlocked the door instead. There was a sinister suggestion about that unlocked door. But Conan did not hesitate. He pushed open the grill and stepped from the dungeon into the outer darkness. As he had thought, the door did not open into another corridor. The flag door stretched away under his feet and the line of cells ran away to right and left behind him, but he could not make out the outer limits of the place into which he had come. He could see neither the roof nor any other wall. The moonlight filtered into that vastness only through the grills of the cells and was almost lost in the darkness. 
less keen eyes than his could scarcely have discerned the dim grey patches that floated before each cell door. Turning to the left, he moved swiftly and noiselessly along the line of dungeons, his bare feet making no sound on the flags. He glanced briefly into each dungeon as he passed it. They were all empty, but locked. In some he caught a glimmer of naked white bones. These pits were a relic of a grimmer age, constructed long ago when Belvarus was a fortress rather than a city. But evidently their more recent use had been more extensive than the world guessed. Ahead of him, presently, he saw the dim outline of a stair sloping sharply upward, and knew it must be the stair he sought. Then he whirled suddenly, crouching in the deep shadows at its foot. Somewhere behind him, something was moving, something bulky and stealthy that padded on feet which were not human feet. He was looking down the long row of cells, before each one of which lay a square of dim grey light that was little more than a patch of less dense darkness. But he saw something moving along these squares. What it was he could not tell, but it was heavy and huge, and yet it moved with more than human ease and swiftness. He glimpsed it as it moved across the squares of grey, then lost it as it merged in the expanses of shadow between. It was uncanny in its stealthy advance, appearing and disappearing like a blur of the vision. He heard the bars rattle as it tried each door in turn. Now it had reached the cell he had so recently quitted, and the door swung open as it tugged. He saw a great bulky shape limed faintly and briefly in the grey doorway, and then the thing had vanished into the dungeon. Sweat beaded Conan's face and hands. Now he knew why Tarascus had come so subtly to his door and later had fled so swiftly. The king had unlocked his door, and somewhere in these hellish pits had opened a cell or cage that held some grim monstrosity. Now the thing was emerging from the cell and was again advancing up the corridor, its misshapen head close to the ground. It paid no more heed to the locked doors, it was smelling out his trail. He saw it more plainly now, the grey light lime, the giant anthropomorphic body, but waster of bulk and girth than any man. It went on two legs, though it stooped forward, and it was greyish and shaggy, its thick coat shot with silver. Its head was a grisly travesty of the human, its long arms hung nearly to the ground. Conan knew it at last, understood the meaning of those crushed and broken bones in the dungeon and recognized the haunter of the pits. It was a grey ape, one of the grisly man-eaters from the forests that wave on the mountainous eastern shores of the Sea of Vilayet. Half mythical and altogether horrible, these apes were the goblins of Hyborian legendary and were in reality ogres of the natural world, cannibals and murderers of the nighted forests. He knew it scented his presence, for it was coming swiftly now, rolling its barrel-like body rapidly along on its short, mighty bold legs. He cast a quick glance up the long stair, but knew that the thing would be on his back before he could mount to the distant door. He chose to meet it face to face. Conan stepped out into the nearest square of moonlight, so as to have all the advantage of illumination that he could, for the beast he knew could see better than himself in the dark. Instantly the brute saw him. Its great yellow tusks gleamed in the shadows, but it made no sound. Creatures of night and the silence, the grey apes of Wilayet were voiceless. 
but in its dim, hideous features, which were a bestial travesty of a human face, showed ghastly exultation. Conan stood poised, watching the oncoming monster without a quiver. He knew he must take his life on one thrust. There would be no chance for another, nor would there be time to strike and spring away. The first blow must kill and kill instantly if he hoped to survive that awful grapple. He swept his gaze over the short, squat throat, the hairy swag belly and the mighty breast swelling in giant arches like twin shields. It must be the heart. Better to risk the blade being deflected by the heavy ribs than to strike in where a stroke was not instantly fatal. With full realization of the odds, Conan matched his speed of eye and hand and his muscular power against the brute might and ferocity of the man-eater. He must meet the brute breast to breast, strike a death blow, and then trust to the ruggedness of his frame to survive the instant of manhandling that was certain to be his. As the ape came rolling in on him, swinging wide its terrible arms, he plunged in between them and struck with all his desperate power. He felt the blade sink to the hilt in the hairy breast and instantly releasing it, he ducked his head and bunched his whole body into one compact mass of knotted muscles, and as he did so, he grasped the closing arms and drew his knee fiercely into the monster's belly, bracing himself against that crushing grapple. For one dizzy instant, he felt as if he were being dismembered in the grip of an earthquake. Then suddenly, he was free, sprawling on the floor, and the monster was gasping out its life beneath him. Its red eyes turned upward, the hilt of the poniard quivering in its breast. His desperate stab had gone home. Conan was panting as if after a long conflict, trembling in every limb. Some of his joints fell as if they had been dislocated, and blood dripped from scratches on his skin where the monster's talons had ripped. His muscles and tendons had been savagely wrenched and twisted. If the beast had lived a second longer, it would surely have dismembered him. But the Cimmerians' mighty strength had resisted, for the fleeting instant it had endured the dying convulsion of the ape that would have torn a lesser man limb from limb.